Thank you for joining me for this video tour of my exhibition inspired by the Masters, which was first installed at the Visions Museum in San Diego, California in 2015, and was later installed at the Texas Quilt Museum in LaGrange, Texas in 2018, which is when I'm making this recording. The pieces that are included in this exhibition represent a wonderful confluence almost a collision between two events in the summer of 2015. The first was that I was able to attend an exhibition of Matisse's paintings at the San Antonio Art Museum. And I was so taken by the exuberant color and by the wild patterning and the skewed perspective that it flipped my world. At about the same time, I'd become very aware because of visiting thrift stores of how many vintage, meaning 70s and 80s, needlework kits that had been completed, how many of those were becoming available, and then I checked eBay and oh my gosh, loads of them, which I think represents a particular end of an era because the makers are of an age where now they're passing and no one values any of these pieces because they were kits or because they were hobbyist. Who knows the reasons why, but I love them. This is how I got my start in the field, to tell you the truth working designs that I developed myself as opposed to kits, but learning the stitches of embroidery and, and being in love with them. So I gradually started to acquire these pieces. I couldn't leave them in the thr thrift store. I couldn't leave them on eBay where who knows you know, what would have happened to them. And here I was building this collection that was rather open-ended. They included things like the needlework that you see, the red flowers in the top right, and this very dense, dense stitching in the piece on the left-hand side, and then this very folk art-like uh, map of states and state flowers, which I think might possibly have been something that someone designed, because I, it doesn't have those typical blue lines that would be uh, an indication of it having been a kit. I was looking at all those pieces and thinking about how I could actually apply them or incorporate them into my work. And so as an artist, what we do is we begin to figure out the stages or the steps that we need in order to bring several different kinds of mediums together, especially when you're like me, somebody who considers herself a mixed media textile artist. One of the things I did was to iron Misty Fuse, which is a fusible interface, uh, sorry, fusible web, which is like a heat sensitive adhesive. I could iron it to the back of these needlework pieces and it would stabilize them. It would also keep, them from, keep the fabric from raveling to some degree. So when I did that, I could use tiny, tiny little embroidery scissors and cut around all of the shapes, including the interior places where fabric would have been exposed, like between the leaves on this set of birds. Trimmed away all of the fabric that I could possibly trim away so that I had this piece that actually was already uh, treated with the Misty Fuse so that I could iron it onto another background once I got my composition started. When you're an artist, ideas don't come fully formed. At least they don't come fully formed for me. It's a path that, that takes shape as you walk the path. I had this idea. I wasn't sure whether it would work, but it began with printing off three or four of the still life paintings by Matisse that I loved. So the color images that you see here are color photocopies that I printed on my home computer of these paintings. There's an example of one. So that would only be about, oh, I don't know, that's an eight and a half by 11 piece of paper. So you can figure what the size is approximately. Once I had the color images printed out, I printed them onto clear acetate, a transparency, which is another thing that you can run through your printer. And once I had the clear transparency, of course it had reduced those colors to a black and white drawing or a gray scale in a sense. I could put that on my overhead projector, which is kind of an outmoded tool in this day and age, but I could project it onto the fabric that I intended to be the background for the piece. Now I was never ever intending for these to be knockoffs of Matisse paintings or Mimics, mimicry of Matisse's paintings. Rather, I wanted to study the composition of Matisse's paintings, and I also wanted to uh, work with, as an inspiration, the composition in terms of the layout, where the windows were, where the, where the table meets the floor, um, how the shutters were flung open. I was more interested in those aspects of how he put together a painting than I was in trying to reproduce anything that people would look at and think, oh yeah, that's a Matisse. 
So I used a water-soluble marker to trace in just the bare bones of the composition, and then I put away the acetates and the clear the pictures of the Matisse paintings and went to work on my own, more or less. First, I added in the background structure, and so here I am. I'm coloring in the table that will be the base of one of my paintings, one of my textile constructions, and I'm using a combination of tools. I am using some paint. I'm also using silk screens to create texture, and I'm using ink tense blocks, which are pigment without uh, a binder. They glide over the fabric and are almost buttery smooth, and when they're dampened slightly, they become permanent on the surface of the cloth. There you can see a piece of lace that I'm also going to audition as a potential table cover underneath some of the other elements that will be added as I go along. One of the, the most exciting and sort of fun parts of the process is to look at all of these embroideries that I have hanging on my wall and think about which ones could work together from a color standpoint or from a subject matter standpoint. And um, in order to, to make those decisions, you've got to have a lot of pieces. So I had real freedom to buy on eBay. At one point, I had over 100 of these embroideries because if you intend to make a series of 14 or 15 pieces and you're expecting to use two or three embroideries incorporated into each of the compositions, you've got to have a lot to choose from. So it was one of those sort of free buying um, experiences that we don't get very often. There was no guilt attached. There you have a, a look at the ink tense blocks that I'm using as I build the color. So this piece is close to completion and you can see that there's patterning printed on top of color, patterning printed on top of patterning. Uh, the, the scene, the woodland scene there, is very densely stitched by someone else, remember. I didn't do that part myself. I only built the composition around it. And in the foreground, you see a bouquet of daffodils in a vase on a linen background. You'll get a better look at this shortly. But the, the detail and the beautiful needlework in these um, really made them come to life for me. It's one thing to have pieces hanging in the studio upon completion. It's another thing to see how they translate into the world at large. I thought I'd switch gears. I'll show you all of the pieces in just a minute, but I wanted to share with you a few of the paintings that influenced me one way or another, some more directly than others. But in this case, love this painting. It doesn't show up in any of my work as an influence, but the color certainly does, especially the fantastic blues and greens in that wall. And the looseness of the floral, um, the bouquets, they're just enchanting. And the marks that are what texture on the wall, texture on the table surface, um, done with such abandon and playfulness. I believe this piece is called The Palm, and one of his paintings that was obviously not a still life, but the lushness of the mark making and the shape of the leaves, so uh, lively. And I've used the word exuberant more than once when I refer to his color palette, and this is just another example. His color palette was nothing less than exuberant. <laughs> this was the very first piece in the series, and I had not yet thought of the idea of projecting onto the wall or copying any of his compositional uh, directive. <clears throat> but I was influenced by that painting, The Palm. And so here you see, hand-drawn with uh, wax crayon and dye markers, I've gotten or, or attempted to get that same sort of looseness with the foliage. These are part of the Grandmother Flower Garden set, and that's partly because they incorporated the quilt block, which is referred to as the Grandmother Flower Garden quilt block pattern. And the birdbath was the very first piece of needlework I acquired before my collection burgeoned to the size that it was. And I adored these birds playing in the water done over needlepoint canvas and was pleased that I could work in the more elegant flower, the, the embroidery on the left. Here's another painting of his, one of my favorites. And if you look carefully, of course, he had a lot of paintings that, that included views of the ocean or the Mediterranean through an open window. And I um, was very influenced by this particular painting when I created this piece. <clears throat> 
And there are a couple of things to know about this piece. On the right hand side, the sailboat, you can see it's a rectangle. That was the original embroidery and one of the greatest challenges of work like this is to mimic and match the sky above and then to recreate the porch railings down below. That was fun. On the left hand side you can see that that piece of needlework is almost a sampler in a sense. It has those squares each of which has a different pattern behind the cat and in order to incorporate that into the background I literally put tracing paper over those blocks and copied them and drew them by hand in order to make a silk screen so that I could continue that pattern up the wall. This is probably one of his wildest compositions when it comes to the, the, the amazing color and energy. And the panel on the right hand side of the wall here was directly related to how I interpreted or how I was moved by that color happening on the right of his composition. This is a fairly straightforward compositional um, reference, of course, you can see that. This, and I've used it several times, this one's called Knitting with Matisse, and the basket of yarn and the needles and that lamp were one rather trite piece of hand embroidery, and so I cut away the background and built my own using a combination of stitching and printing. This was the first time that I experimented with bringing the table cover off of the composition so that it literally hangs away from the piece in order to enhance the sense of dimension. <clears throat> and the vase here started as a table runner with that beautiful white work edge. And because of how I was sewing these pieces and fusing them to the surface, I could easily turn it into a vase. I live in San Antonio, Texas, and this is the sort of color scheme that we live with every day. I adore it. it. Reminds me of visiting Mexico City, sitting on a balcony somewhere. Such a rich sort of a, an atmosphere. And as is so often true with the way things evolve in my own work, serendipitously a friend brought me a weaving from Mexico, and it, it along with this painting, inspired this piece. Now, I haven't talked a lot about how I actually attached the fruits and vases and flowers to the background, but I have a machine called an embellisher, and it is, it's like a sewing machine, but it has seven needles that are like fishing hooks. They're barbed, and when you stitch two layers through this embellishing machine, the needles go up and down, and they literally shred what's underneath and pull it upwards and shred what's on top and push it down so that it turns into one surface. When I was applying these vases of flowers, I went around all of the edges with the needle felting machine in order to sink the edges into the background, which would keep them from raveling, of course, but would, would also embed them into the surface in a way that made them feel uh, more part of the, the whole background. That was the point. I used a tiny pair of tweezers as I worked because when the needles were going up and down through the fabric, they were severing the background fabric bits that were still left where I had trimmed away the edges. And with, the, with these little pair of scissors, I could pull those threads out one at a time as I worked <clears throat> my way all the way around this bouquet. So that was fairly labor intensive, but it also helps make it look as though the pieces are literally on the surface or sunk into the surface. All of the fruits I created were created on black felt using roving, which is an unspun wool. So it's almost like tearing apart a cotton ball. I'd pull apart the various colors and lay them on the black felt and then use that machine to shred it and needle felt it all together. And in that way, I could blend the color to create the volume and to create the shading on the forms. Another painting of his, I think this one is called Open Window. And there's my interpretation of it. The piece with the boats is about two-thirds the size of the window and I once again did my best to match color wise and with the needle felting of some of that roving to create the sky a sky that would blend and work with what was already there. Of course
course, down in front, we've got two really exuberant bouquets, one a needlepoint piece on the left, and then on the right, an, a hand-embroidered cruel piece that also includes what they refer to as turkey work. Turkey work makes a series of loops on the surface, and so the yellow flowers were made by make, packing those loops very tightly together. The purple flowers were made by creating all those loops and then taking a little pair of scissors and trimming off the tops in order to make them fuzzy and fluffy. <coughs> Never did I take an image from one of Matisse's paintings deliberately except for this one example. If you look at the portrait on the wall of this very amazing, the colors fabulous, aren't they? In person, this piece looks pretty bright, but it's nothing compared to his wild color. But there you see my version of the portrait. So I was able to copy, line draw that portrait and turn it into a silk screen so that I could add it to this piece in homage to Matisse. This piece is called Matisse's Bird Feeder. It was another example of a fabulous hand embroidered um, piece with all of these amazing birds, just so colorful and lovely. Whoever made that piece must have had, just had a ball doing it. And then I had the flowers for the vase on the right. And you can see doilies put together to create that white table cover. The, in this case, both the vase and the bowl are my own hand-painted and printed fabrics cut and in, turned into these various parts that I needed in order to complete the composition. I fell in love with this compote and hoped that I could find some of that white work I was talking about, the table linens and runners, hoped I could find one that I could use to mimic that shape. And this is what I came up with. The white milk glass cup on the right is directly taken, cut out of a table runner. The orange compote was hand painted and then needle felted. And this is an example of artistic license. I really wanted it to be white because his was so beautiful but white against the white tablecloth would never have cut it, wouldn't have been interesting at all. And so instead I chose to create the compote in orange and then used again my blue fabrics to create the vase for this beautiful spray of flowers and jumped into an attempt, which, which I love, to add the, the again, the 3D table sur service with this lace hanging down um, as it would had we been in the dining room itself. This is a beautiful uh, example of one of his outdoor paintings. I believe this is called The Garden Gate. And his garden gate inspired my Frida's Gate uh, in homage of Frida Kahlo's fabulous garden in Mexico City. And you may recognize that spray of sunflowers on the right from one of my earliest pictures both that particular piece and the ferns in front were quite large. This piece is about, uh, it's over six feet tall. So I'd been waiting for an opportunity to use those really large embroideries, those uh, actually when they're in wool, they're referred to as cruel, C-R-E-W-E-L. The cruel embroidery here needed a large scale image in order for it to work. And so I didn't have anything but an image of having been to Frida Kahlo's garden in Mexico City. And this is from that standpoint completely imaginary. I was nearing the end of the series as I had envisioned it and I still had all these wonderful bird pieces left. I hadn't been able to work them into anything <clears throat> up to that point but I hated to finish the series and leave them in the drawer frankly. And then I found this waterfall cruel piece which is about 9 by 12 on eBay. And when it arrived, I, I could see it. I could see it completely. And it took my whole series full circle, didn't it? Because I was able, again, to incorporate the Grandmother Flower Garden quilt blocks, which are orange. In this case, I dyed them again, into the green hand-dyed and printed background. And this became Grandmother Matisse's Flower Garden. So it gave me an opportunity to take all of the varied bird pieces that I'd trimmed so carefully before. You may recognize the piece down on the left-hand corner from an earlier picture. I was able to put them all together in this 
final piece and perhaps it's one of my favorites it's it's hard to choose but it's definitely one that I'm particularly fond of because of how of the birds have come together and now we're back to that very early piece again just a little review of how birds and the, the mark making and the flower garden quilt pieces have come full circle When that very first piece had been completed, I did do a second piece before I launched on the pieces that were compositionally inspired by Matisse. So this was the second grandmother's flower garden, and it was again an opportunity to use those quilt blocks and to practice using the Soy Wax MX die crayons to create all of the, the foliage in the style of Matisse's The Palm. This one is called In the Solarium with Matisse. It gave me an opportunity to use all these kind of odd photo, odd pieces that didn't fit anywhere in anywhere as pictures. They're not really photos, but in, as pictures on the wall. So the, the swan was a needlepoint pillow that was a square. Uh, that, that tiny little painting of the jug was odd because there was a certain, these go back longer. I think these must be 30s or 40s when there was this... Uh, style of hand painting in this case the jug or the vase and then hand stitching the flowers that were coming out of it and on the left that's a cross stitch of a young girl that, that was incomplete and so part of of the black line that would have eventually been completed with stitching was left undone which I thought made it even more charming there you can see uh, that vase and flowers was one composition so that I could cut out the whole thing and use it in its entirety. And again, using the, the kind of skewed perspective and these flat doilies, turning them into parts of the tabletop. Matisse had a real fondness for cats, so it was fun to incorporate. And, you know, cats, cats are popular. Cats show up in various forms of needlework a lot more than any other animal. Um, which I like because I'm a cat person myself. From the standpoint of this being, actually this is the piece that I was making when you were looking at the images of me beginning the composition. And so I had colored the bottom of the composition brown and now I've put this overlay of lace on it to create the tabletop. I wanted to blend the left hand side up away from the needlepoint piece which actually ends you can see a, a line that runs about halfway across the composition. The, the flowers below the, I think those are Black Eyed Susans, the flowers that are below that line were part of the original needlepoint. What I did was to hand paint the fabric above the piece, match the color the best I could, create a texture that then came back down onto the needlepoint. On the left you can see the white paint, the printing, on the needlepoint piece and then I drew the black eyed Susans up into the upper half of the of the left side and used the needle felting machine to add the wool to in order to to bring the composition up and tie the two parts together <clears throat> The open window seemed the perfect inspiration yet again for this outside scene. Um, this is in the technique referred to as eagle lochkoi, which is a Russian punch needle method of adding thread to a surface. And I ran into only two eagle lochkoi pieces, and they both were used in these open window configurations. Um, this piece was again a piece where the, the, the exterior scene ends right above the characters that you see almost in the middle of the window. So the sky above that portion was the sky that I created and matched in order to complete it and, and make it compositionally fit a little bit better inside the window. This was the only piece that I actually, uh, there were some departures. The frame around the window and the 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 orange and, and green sort of stuff down at the bottom behind the flowers, those were both handmade papers that were fused into the background as I went along with my printing and my painting. I was getting a little more experimental at that point, and this was much later in the development of the series. 
And although the series came to a natural conclusion, were I to return to it, I think I would begin by incorporating um, even more mixed media materials like these beautiful handmade papers than I used the first time around. Another version of the open window. I think we looked at this one a little bit earlier. I think this was flat on the table, wasn't it? Now you get to see it in its entirety with that beautiful linen vase that was outlined in black. So it was pretty easy to cut around that and um, use the needle felting machine to embed it into the surface. There again, another version of the this one, and I think now we get a detail of it so that you can really see how I extended the porch railing down all the way to the bottom of the corner there. I did that by matching the color and using ink tents, crayons, and blocks to color the yellow and then the blue of the water. And then I used black embroidery thread to hand stitch along the railings to mimic the black hand stitching that was already in the original piece. I hope you've enjoyed looking at this work with me. And I just wanted to mention before we close that the 14 works created for the exhibition are available in a catalog which can be purchased on my website. So you can go to www.janedunwald.com if you would like a copy of the catalog for yourself. It includes a wonderful essay by the Texas Quilt Museum director, Dr. Sandra Sider, and a statement of my own. And all the work is currently available for sale. If there's something you saw that you really love, contact me and here's the address. Thanks for being with me today. I hope you enjoyed this.